Hi folks! Welcome back to the fifth and final presentation for this year's Slurm User Group meeting. Uh, first, since I got so much crap last year, I have the hat. Hat is here for the entire presentation. Have no worry. So, I am the fifth presenter out of five today. Um, each of these videos is uh, captured as a separate YouTube live stream. Uh, these will be available for at least a couple weeks after we wrap up the presentations here today. Uh, I have moderation help from a couple other SkidMD staff. Uh, they'll be helping to triage and respond to questions a bit in the chat. I'll also be trying to directly monitor them and directly respond to them here as well. So I'm here to talk about the Slurm 2108 release and further on into the future. Starting with our general overview of our release strategy, uh, we have, these are all the recent and upcoming Slurm release releases that are relevant. Uh, we have the 2011 release that was done in November 2020. We actually released that live during the SC20 Birds of a Feather session. We have the 2108 release uh, that is the most recent and that was made just this August. Coming up we have the 2205 release in May 20 of 22 and then the 23 and there's a typo here uh, 2302 release in February of 2023. Slurm major releases come out every nine months. Those are what we just went over on the last slide. And then we have maintenance releases such as 2108.1 that come out roughly monthly just with bug fixes. Um, SkedMD officially supports the two most recent major releases. So at the moment, that's the 2108 release that just came out and the 2011 release from last November. So on to an overview of the 2108 release itself. I'm just going to dive right in here with a bunch of different sort of features and minor enhancements. Um, this will go on for about 15, 20 slides. If you have questions, feel free to interrupt me at any point here and I'll try and answer them as I can. So uh, one common request has been for the accounting subsystem to actually capture the exact raw unmodified job submission command that the user ran. So we did that. Uh, it's now captured by default in the database. And uh, you can access this with the dash O submit line flag to the S account format uh, to be able to fetch this back out. As an example here, um, hopefully this is legible on the stream. Uh, apologies if the font's a little small. Uh, you can see here I'm requesting from S account the job ID, the user, and the submit line run out to 50 characters just for a couple of test jobs run through as a demo here. Uh, is there a mechanism to prevent interactive jobs for a selected partition, Damien? Um, you can capture uh, that and actually modify them uh, through the job submit script. Uh, that, that'd be where I'd start. Um, you're welcome to open a support ticket. I, I think our folks can help walk through how to, how to set up and tweak that. Um, I believe there is a way to deny them there based on a partition level, uh, but there's not a direct configuration element for that. Uh, back to the slide, uh, store batch scripts in the Slurm database. This is another common request to permanently archive the actual user job scripts that have been submitted. Historically, we've been adverse to doing this. We didn't want to fill up the database with, with stuff that's not as relevant. Um, but we've seen a ton of sites that do want to do this, and this is a new optional feature uh, starting in 2108. There's this new accounting store flags option of job script. This will store the job scripts in the database. There's also uh, accounting store flags job env that'll store the job environment files verbatim as well. The s account batch script and s account envars options can be used to fetch them back at a later point from the accounting subsystems. Uh, so the slide here is just an example using the wrap option to s batch just to submit a trivial script into the system um, and then fetching this back out later here with the s account command. Um, you can also see uh, if you use the wrap command, uh, we put this little comment into those, those job scripts saying uh, we used sbatch dash dash wrap here. Um, this is another long standing request um, for this idea of a planned node state uh, to sinfo and some of the other user visible tools. Um, for compute nodes in your system that are not currently busy but are planned to be busy in the future instead of showing them marked as idle uh, which tends to get your users complaining that their own jobs aren't immediately launching on them we've changed this instead just to show planned 
uh, to indicate that we, we do have a plan to use them. They're not currently completely idle. Uh, you can usually submit a smaller, uh, shorter time limit job and get it backfilled into that compute node. But otherwise, we're holding that node empty for a larger, higher priority job to actually occupy it at some point in the future. So this is the behavior currently in the Slurm 2011 and older releases. Um, you can see here, I do have a uh, job that's sitting there pending on resources. So it's waiting for something to free up. And if I look at sinfo, um, you can see that, that there's this idle node. Um, and as, as a user, an idle node should be their node. So why is my job not launching? Um, why can't I put a one node job in the system uh, with an indefinite time limit and immediately launch it? Well, we have a plan to, to run this. Um, and that's why here, this changes the output to the Slurm 2108 release where you see instead of idle, we're marking it as planned to try and indicate it's not currently doing something, but there is a plan to use it. So uh, moving on, um, one enhancement request to the auth JWT subsystem was to be able to support other token types. Uh, we've extended its support and can now use RS-256 tokens in addition to the HS-256 support that we originally started with. Uh, keys for this RS-256 support need to be loaded in through a JWKS file. Um, for example, AWS Cognito can generate this for you automatically. Uh, this option, auth alt parameters, JWKS equals whatever the path is to JWKS is how you can get a hold of that and uh, have it load those key files in. And then you can use keys that have been generated by your other system that's capable of generating RS-256 formatted keys uh, in Slurm directly. Uh, this is just an example of setting this up here. You can see in my configuration file, I've got this set. You can use this alongside the existing built-in HS-256 support as well, just by specifying both the JWKS as well as your HS-256 keys. Um, this is just an example of uh, my personal JWKS key that was generated out of AWS Cognito. Uh, one other major structural change that we don't expect to have any impact on, on end users is a significant overhaul of the cgroup subsystems in Slurm. Um, Slurm was actually a very early adopter of cgroups. Um, I believe our support is at least a decade old at this point. Um, and it had been cut up in, in some sort of complicated ways between different subsystems for what we call proc track, job account gather, and the task subsystems. Each of these had some subtle discrepancies in how they interacted with the underlying cgroup hierarchies and maintained those and tore them down at the end. Um, and we did find that that was leading to a number of unusual edge cases when things didn't go quite according to plan. As part of this refactor, all of those have now converged into a single cgroup plugin underneath the covers that handles the actual manipulation of the cgroup hierarchy uh, and then handles that in a more unified way that that leads to better setup and teardown that's more consistent. And then longer term, that same new plugin interface is where we expect to put future cgroup v2 support although that is not there in the current 2108 release. Uh, we do expect to have that at some point in the future. We're, we're working on getting that uh, prepared and running now. Uh, Marshall had an entire presentation on this a bit earlier uh, for burst buffer Lewis support. Um, this is the idea of a generic burst buffer. Um, this is really a set of hooks that let you do asynchronous things to your compute job. Uh, the key part of this interface is that the compute nodes have not been allocated and assigned to the job yet, and that the at the tail end after the job has finished running and released all of its compute assets, you then also get a chance to do something else. Um, the most immediate and obvious use of this is for sort of burst buffer style file system operations where you're moving files around. Um, but we've heard of some interesting plans uh, to, to use this to do dynamic network setup and do some other things that are related to getting the compute job running, but are best done at a time when the compute nodes aren't sitting there idle. Um, so again, I'd encourage you to uh, look at the presentation from Marshall that was done earlier today. Um, and, and we are still uh, willing to change the burst buffer term to something else if anyone has a good suggestion of a, a different name. Uh, burst buffer is just the first sort of thing that was implemented here. 
and the name has stuck for now. Uh, but we do know that this is obviously a, a much more powerful interface than, than just for burst buffers. As part of that burst buffer work, we actually introduced the Slurm script D process. Uh, Marshall talked a bit about this as well. Uh, part of that development, uh, we were trying to avoid adding any additional fork exec calls within the Slurm controller process itself. We've known for a long time that these can be quite expensive, especially on very high throughput environments. And we were trying to find a way to still be able to build new processes, but without taking the overhead of the fork directly in the Slurm controller. So we built a separate process that runs directly alongside the Slurm controller that's dedicated solely to task running on our behalf. At the moment, we've only really moved the new burst buffer stuff into it, as well as the prolog Slurm control D and epilogue Slurm control D scripts. We do expect to start moving other things to this interface. Uh, and moving almost all of the fork exec call patterns out of the SERM controller itself off into something else in the future. Uh, Chris Coffey, I see a question. It seems like storing the job scripts in the database could end up with quite a large database. Um, certainly, that, that's why we have not historically done that directly. Um, obviously, this is going to depend on the throughput for your site and how large of a job script people tend to submit. Um, this is an option. It is off by default for that reason. If your site chooses to turn it on, you can. If you do turn it on and you start finding that your database uh, starts growing quite rapidly, you may want to look at using the archive and purge options in the Slurm database uh, to help limit that. Uh, alongside uh, some of the other things that happened in the 2011 release itself is we did actually sneak in this new plugin, Job Container TempFS, um, that was developed uh, by Aditi at NERSC. Um, as a new plugin, uh, we felt that it was fairly safe to introduce this mid-release. Um, unless you explicitly turn this on, it doesn't affect anything else. Um, so it, it did bypass our usual no new functionality or feature changes rules with those stable releases. Uh, we were actually really surprised to see how many sites started picking up and adopting this. Um, unfortunately, there are a few edge cases that aren't quite handled correctly in the 2011 release. We've done a lot of cleanup. We've moved some of those interfaces around um, as part of some refactoring work in the 2108 release. Um, and we're, we're happy that a lot of underlying issues with restarting the Slurm D process, for example, have been resolved with some architectural changes here. Um, if you haven't used this yet, I, I would encourage you to take a look at it. It is a very nice way to isolate the user's temporary files from everything else um, on the file system. Uh, by giving them a file system namespace that will automatically get cleaned up when their job is kicked off that node. Uh, one other thing that had been requested uh, was JSON or YAML output uh, from some of the, the normal Slurm commands. We, we do understand that parsing our, our usual traditional column-oriented uh, text can be a bit of a headache. Um, so now, uh, using something like the jq command, you can do your parsing yourself. Um, we've added JSON and YAML output, both to sAccount, sInfo, and sQ for the most common operations. This is using the exact same serialization and translation code that the Slurm RESTD does, but without needing to actually start up and launch the Slurm RESTD and issue REST commands to actually fetch the data back out. Uh, support for this is limited just to output from these. A lot of the um, subselection commands and filtering rules are not necessarily applicable to this. It will generate a lot of data. But if you are looking for something to parse and sort of interpret some of the command output, I'd encourage you to look at this as a strong alternative to directly trying to parse Slurm's column formats. Uh, this is just a very trivial example uh, where you can see I'm asking for JSON output out of the S account command. I'm using the JQ command just to filter it based on jobs. And then um, obviously this terminal, this slide is a bit limited how much I can show. So I'm just grabbing the top 14 columns of it here and uh, showing them as just a basic reference. Uh, another new thing coming in is this idea of sending shared libraries alongside the srun bcast command. Um, for sites that are doing massive MPI style workloads and trying to launch tasks on thousands of nodes simultaneously, uh, we have certainly um, can make most parallel file systems extremely unhappy. 
So the srun bcast command was, was developed to be able to send files out using Slurm's built-in communication hierarchy. This means that the srun command would open the executable directly and send a copy of that out to the compute nodes, presumably placing them in a scratch uh, that's local, um, like a tempfs uh, area on that, that compute node, and avoiding hitting the parallel file system from all of the compute nodes simultaneously. This works great for static executables, uh, but what we've seen is if you broadcast a executable that's linked with shared libraries, all we've done is remove the overhead from the initial executable open, and if those shared libraries are also on the parallel file system, that same thundering herd comes rampaging right back in. We've gone through, um, and in 2108, this is a new optional thing you can turn on where the srun bcast command itself will actually do the shared library resolution directly on whichever node it's running on and send all of those libraries alongside the executable over to the compute nodes. Those will be placed, again, in a, a tempfs directory usually, and then the executable will be running off of those copies of the shared libraries via some LD library path manipulation that's being handled automatically by the srun command. Um, the idea here is to let you use shared libraries, at, uh, shared executables at scale without the endemic performance problems from your parallel file system melting down here. This is turned on. Um, again, it's off by default, but it's turned on with uh, for everyone by default with this bcast parameter send libs. Um, you can also turn it on on a job by job basis by using srun bcast dash dash send libs, uh, which will then do it. Um, there's also this bcast exclude option um, that tells Slurm to ignore certain system libraries uh, directories uh, as part of that path and, and library resolution uh, so that you're not sending over 11 million copies of libc to the compute nodes. Uh, presumably you have a libc on the compute nodes. If you don't, I, good luck. <laughs> um, so it defaults to lib, user lib. If you have some other file uh, directory paths that are relevant, you can adjust this for your, your site. Um, Nancy, I'll take that question at the end. I'm actually going to skip it for now. Um, one other thing that Nate talked about earlier today, OCI container support. So there's initial support for launching a process inside of an OCI container um, so that the Slurm pieces will handle the file system namespacing stuff um, and do that setup for you. And you don't have to rely on an external tool like Shifter, like Singularity, doing that, that setup for you. Um, Nate's presentation goes into a lot more detail on this from earlier today. Uh, you can see that, that archived YouTube stream as well uh, separately on the SketMD channel. Uh, one other thing, again, backend work, um, but we have gone through and uh, the, the job step throughput for a given job uh, is greatly increased in the 2108 release due to some code cleanup and refactoring work that we've done. Um, and this is also nicely complementing that experimental option still of enable RPC queue. Um, Jason went into a little bit of detail on this earlier today. Um, it's still experimental, but we have seen some, some massive performance improvements from, from that newly refactored work alongside that RPC queuing mechanism. Um, uh, one, uh, maybe a parameter to decide if the submission script stored in the database can be added to the slurm.conf um, to limit the maximum size of the scripts to store. Uh, that's an interesting idea. We don't have anything that filters that today. Um, that, that would be an interesting enhancement request uh, to open at some point. Uh, Chris Coffey, uh, can I comment on site situations that have issues with enable RPC queue? Um, there are a few extremely rare edge cases that the RPC queue does not correctly catch right now um, that can lead to problems. There are a few open tickets on that. We expect to have patches in to address those. Um, it is also just a, a substantial refactoring of the underlying network code. Uh, we want to make sure that other folks have gotten a lot more testing in a lot more diverse environments before we sort of promote it up out of experimental status. Uh, Aditi, does Slurm Script D get enabled in 2108 by default? Yes, the Slurm Script D is always running in 2108. Uh, you will always see the Slurm Script D process running alongside the Slurm controller. It's automatically start and started and stopped by the Slurm controller. You don't have to do anything to make it work. It is always, always there and always active going forward. So 
Um, that's the end of the 2108 release overview. Um, if you have questions specific to that, uh, I'm going to pause here just for a brief second before jumping into the 2205 roadmap. Okay, Slurm 2205. So um, one note, and this section is actually going to be very, very short at the moment. Um, SkedMD's approach to handling our, our public roadmap has always been extremely conservative. The published roadmap that you're seeing here today only includes work that we 100% have committed to and will definitely be in that 2205 release. We do have several other projects um, that are in the works for 2205 that I can't talk about just yet, unfortunately. Um, we're, we're working on them, but we have not yet locked all the contract details in. Um, we structurally prefer this no vaporware approach, uh, although I, I concede that right now this roadmap set of, uh, of slides is very short and very underwhelming uh, for some sites. Um, we hope to expand on this. Um, hopefully by November, when we get to the, the Slurm Birds of a Feather session, I'll have a little bit more here to report. So uh, one, of the, one of those committed projects is this idea of a preferred set of node constraints. So for a long time, we've had the hard constraints, dash dash constraint, that you can set as an option to a job when you submit it. Um, but this is now gonna be complemented by the idea of sort of a soft constraint. Um, this is the same syntax, same capabilities as the hard constraint model, but it's not strictly enforced. These constraints will be considered at job submission or at um, when it is time to actually launch the job. We will first look for nodes that ideally match the soft constraints. If those are available, we'll launch exclusively on the on the nodes that have those soft constraints. Um, if they're not available, we'll set the soft constraints aside and only go back to strictly enforcing the hard constraints. Um, so this gives you a little more flexibility. Um, if you, as, a, as an end user, like to steer your compute jobs, say, to AMD CPUs over Intel CPUs in the cluster, this would be one way that you could potentially do it while still taking advantage of whichever node opens up first on the system. Um, so if your job had been sitting in the queue for a bit, was highest priority, we're, we're going to try and land it on, on what matches your soft constraints. But if we can get it to launch right now, we'll just go back to the hard constraint model. Uh, another idea is this GPU sharding. Um, you can think of this as, as taking the current GPU plugins and letting an admin define an arbitrary number of ways that that one resource is allowed to be split up between cooperating compute jobs. The key here is that this is really designed for cooperating workloads. There is no hardware resource enforcement behind this. There's no software resource enforcement behind this either. It's designed for jobs that know that they can kind of mutually coexist on a GPU because they're only using a small portion of the resources, um, but where you're not able to take use of newer features like the um, the NVIDIA A100's MIG mode um, to, to hardware chop up that resource. So this will allow the administrator to define how many slices they want to make available. The job can request between zero and all slices of that resource. And then the scheduler will just make sure that we, we have not over subscribed those, those slices. Um, and those slices will always be co-located on the same card. They won't be 50% on one card, 50% on the other. Uh, again, important caveat, there's no real enforcement behind this. This is really only designed for jobs that are able to cooperate amongst themselves correctly. Uh, one, maybe two new plugins will also be coming in for Account Gather Interconnect. Um, this is the accounting subsystem that grabs network statistics off of a given interconnect. Uh, we'll be adding support both for OmniPath as well as the HP Slingshot Interconnect. Uh, and then I have one slide for the 2302 release actually uh, coming up in February of 2023. Uh, this is a bit bigger and has been sort of related to a lot of, of requests from people over the years. Um, the idea of adding support for truly dynamic nodes to your cluster. Um, Moving away from where you need to restart the Slurm D processes throughout the system, restart the Slurm controller to be able to pick up changes in your node definitions. Currently, and this is how we work with the current cloud computing model, um, we have a way that you are able to define nodes as future, 
but you still need to provide a lot of details about processor count, memory, um, so that the scheduler can sort of pre-allocate and pre-plan around these future nodes. Um, it also means that as you change those future definitions around, you do still end up having to restart all the processes through the cluster. The plan here with 2302 is to move away from that and let Slurm actually truly support dynamic nodes being added and removed from the cluster, remove a lot of that overhead of, of how you have to manage around this. Slurm's original design kind of assumed that you would buy your cluster as one big unit from, from the underlying vendor, and then you'd run it that way in perpetuity until you moved on to the next cluster. Uh, we know that doesn't quite align with the realities of a lot of systems, does not really work, especially in more cloud-oriented environments today. So we're finally going to get a chance to move away from some of those architectural assumptions we had made a lot earlier on. Uh, we will be doing a lot of underlying work for this in 2205, um, but the actual support for this uh, is not going to be available until 2302, February of 2023. Uh, a couple notes before I just jump back to uh, more questions. Um, upcoming events, um, we are going to be having a Slurm booth on the SC21 show floor, uh, booth number 3215. Uh, it will be a bit of a skeleton crew staffing that compared to our usual presence. Um, we have just got notification that our Birds of a Feather session that we historically hold has been accepted for the conference. Um, we have requested it to be held as a fully virtual session um, we're still pending confirmation that that will be happening, but we, we do expect, even if that doesn't happen, to have some sort of virtual form of the Birds of a Feather session happening in late November in some fashion. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go back to questions. Um, I'm at the end of my usual time, ske uh, time schedule here. Um, but I am last in the day very intentionally so that I can run late. If you guys have a lot of other questions, I'm happy to continue chatting for uh, as long as you guys are, are available and have interesting questions to ask. So uh, with that, I'm going to jump back to Nancy's question that I deferred on earlier. Um, Nancy, uh, will PMIX v4 be supported in 2108, specifically in reference to uh, one of our, our internal or one of our tickets uh, uh, about adding PMIX calls. Uh, at the moment, we do not plan to support PMIX v4 in the Slurm 2108 release. Um, it's still eligible for inclusion in the upcoming 2205 release. Um, parts of that plugin may be able to run back in the 2108 release, but it's not a feature that we committed to supporting there and does require at least some refactoring of the existing PMIX plugin. So it's not something we're comfortable doing in a a supported release. Uh, PMIX support for V1, V2, and V3 is out there, um, as well as support for PMI2 uh, and the extremely legacy PMI1. Ah, let's see, just catching up here on questions in the chat channel. Um, Joe, any way for a user to view SBatch standard out and standard error in real time? Looking for an alternative to reading uh, directly out of the file. So, um, as some background, the way that Slurm handles job IO is a little bit different from other schedulers. We don't try to internally cache and redirect the IO through a central location. Instead, the batch host itself is going to be what is directly writing that into the file for you. Um, this avoids a lot of network contention moving the, the IO traffic back and forth. Um, it avoids file system issues and file system load all coming from the head node in your cluster where the Slurm controller is running. Um, but it does mean that this is being written straight into that output file and you cannot indirectly uh, access that standard out standard error. Uh, you have to go to that file to get it at this point in time. Um, if there's sufficient interest, we may look at ways to do a little bit of limited interception on this in the future. Um, one thing that is kind of interesting, a, a very underused command in Slurm is sattach, which does let you connect to step IO, um, but that does not work for the what we call the batch step, the part that's running the batch script. So you can uh, access IO for steps that are run through srun, uh, just not for sbatch. Uh, are there other questions? I'm going to pause here for about 10 seconds due to the broadcast delay just to make sure that you guys have one last chance to ask anything. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm not seeing any further questions, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up here. Um, I do want to thank you all for uh, participating in this. Um, I know it's not our, our preferred venue. We, we do hope to go back to an in-person Slur Music Group meeting at some point, hopefully next year. Um, but for now, uh, this is this is what we have to work with. Um, thank you guys all again for attending and participating. Um, thanks to all the other presenters, uh, as well as the moderation crew here for, for lending me a hand today. Um, so I will say with that, thank you all. Uh, and have a good day slash evening slash whichever time zone you guys are in. Thanks, guys.